Lame Pass a small man. Dark. Kinda hunched over. But he was a serious gunfighter. He was a serious kid. He was a man. Oh, 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 oh. That man from He's probably the, the, the Poco Motor, the original Rolling 60 Grip. He, 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 from the Dinkers to that, is him. He, he was that. They gathered around him. Dinkers, you talking about the Dinker Crips? Yeah, Dinker Crips. Yeah, Dinker Crips. Dinker Boy was a little bit further off between 74 and 50. We wiped them out. Well, we didn't wipe them out, we just gave them all made. Like Took used to do. Took would walk up on you. You might be from, say, the Rebel Rousers, the gang that preceded the Harlem, the original Harlem Crips. The Rebel Rousers. He took a walk up to you, him and his group, and say, Is it Crip or what? Is it Crip or what? And or what means you gonna get down right here. You gonna get down or you gonna lay down. If you lay down, you gonna stay down. That's the rules. It was just dog eat dog. And in this environment, Mike is right. For who you know, who your sister is, is more of us than you. Mike is right. Or Mike is usually never right. It's all about. Is it crip or what? Is it crippled? When the beat started, eight trays and six. Was you in communication with Tuck? No, no, no. The last time I saw him was January 79. That's how long. I didn't see him in jail, none. When you went to 86, I was sad when. And when he was that boy, he cut the East Rock out from the shoe. So, tell me about my guy, Odie Shaw, rest in peace. You know, I had I had the unfortunate lot of being accused of shooting Cody Shaw. But him and another cat pushed by. The three of us, they threw, we threw. They left. So I, uh, I called the homies from the original West, Big Side Winding Bay, got rest in peace. By the time they come down, now it's too far over now. They come down 69. Go hang out. Oh. I said, that motherfucker got a gun. We had an AR-15. But this dude Odie driving. The dude hanging out the window with another dude. So we jump in, make our shit. Now it's a high speed chase, but through the hood. Now I'm fool hanging out and took a walk up to you and him and his group and say, is it Crip or what? Is it Crip or what? To be executed in California was the notorious leader of the Crips gang, Stanley Tukey Williams. Stanley Williams has spent 23 years, nearly half his life, at San Quentin State Prison near San Francisco, awaiting execution for robbing and murdering four people. Williams says since he's been on death row, he's had time to reflect on the violence and destruction he caused by founding the Crips, the most notorious street gang in America. And 11 years ago, in an effort to redeem himself, he made an appeal to street gangs everywhere to make peace. Working together, we can put an end to this cycle that creates deep pain in the hearts of our mothers, our fathers, and our people who have lost loved ones to this senseless violence. Now, at age 50, Stanley Williams is literally trying to rewrite his violent history. From his nine by four foot prison cell, he has authored nine books for school children that warn about the perils of gangs and violence, gangs and drugs, gangs and self-esteem, and about the harsh realities of life in prison. And from death row, Williams has been running a one-man multimedia campaign to promote his anti-gang message, which extends from the internet where he has his own website to a reverential made-for-TV movie about his life. I used to be the king of the Crips. Look at my kingdom now. You don't want to be in a gang. I've turned my life around. You can too. I'll show you how. And what may be unheard of for a convicted murderer, Williams is actually invited by public schools to talk directly to students by telephone from death row. A friend of mine from another school was shot and killed, and, um, 
couple of weeks ago. Uh, not the friend of mine was shot, but he survived. The students who had read William's book, Life in Prison, prepared a list of questions for him. Hi, Mr. Williams. Hi, hello. Hi, my name is Marianne. Hello, Marianne. Okay, um, my question is, your book talks about transformation. How do we know it's sincere? Uh, my work speaks for itself. I'm not trying to convince anyone of my transformation. I know I've changed. God knows I have changed. And the individuals who are listening to my voice should be able to detect that uh, I've actually made a transformation. It took uh, years and years for me to uh, experience a change. I started off reading a lot. It opened up a new world for me, and uh, in time, I developed a conscience, and I was no longer uh, filled with uh, self-hate. So my question is, are you afraid of dying or death? Why or why not? Hey, that's a nice question. I like that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> pretty profound. Um, well, honestly, uh, I don't want to die, but uh, a death is a constant reminder here. But it's something that uh, I live with and I can't dwell upon all the time because I have to do what I can in order to write these books. The students told us that what Stanley Williams has to say is having an impact on them at a critical time in their lives when the pressure can be strong to join a gang. Some people say that he's not sincere, that this is a ploy to get off death row or to get out of prison. How would you respond to that? I think some of those people are simple minded because they see, they think that people can't really change. But what he has done is turned his whole life around, and you can see that he's sincere because all the books he's written, the trouble he's going through to try to turn people the other way that are going down the path he did. It is Stanley Williams' work with these children and thousands of others who read his books that prompted a member of the Swiss Parliament to nominate him for a Nobel Peace Prize four years ago, placing him in the company of people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the Dalai Lama, Today. And, and Mother, Mother Teresa. Teresa. But, you know, this is a man who has been convicted of, of four murders. There's no question about the founding of the Crips, the violence and life of mayhem that he led. I, I don't understand how you then nominate someone like that for the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, there's no question that he has had, you know, a, a, a violent past. But, you know, the same is true of uh, some other people that have won the Nobel Peace Prize as well. Henry Kissinger was awarded it in 1973, and, you know, many people would claim that he's a war criminal. Um, F.W. de Klerk got it uh, with the end of apartheid. He'd uh, supervised that system of racism and oppression. I am aware that he has been nominated. I've actually had the opportunity to spend several hours with Mother Teresa when she visited here at San Quentin, as I was one of her personal escorts uh, through the prison. And Stanley Williams is no Mother Teresa. What do you think he's trying to accomplish with these books? Well, I think that all of this is all part of uh, uh, his way of attempting to escape the executioner and being held accountable for the heinous crime he committed on March 11th, 1979, when he shot a 67-year-old man in a in a motel and shot his 63-year-old wife, then turned and shot his 43-year-old uh, daughter. And I think that he's trying to escape that uh, consequence. Although Stanley Williams has lost all of his numerous appeals so far, he still maintains he's innocent of the four murders that landed him in prison. We went to San Quentin recently to meet Williams. We weren't allowed to bring our television cameras inside but we were permitted to have these photographs taken in a visitor's cage on death row. The next day, I spoke with Williams by speakerphone. Some of your critics have said that, that you're writing these books is merely a, a ploy by a, a guilty man, and that what you want to do is do nice things for society only after you've been locked away and sentenced to die. If that were true, there would be hundreds of others here and abroad doing likewise before and after me. I'm not a coward and I would never step on the backs of children to save my life. The Federal Appeals Court in California, which a year and a half ago upheld Stanley Williams' death penalty conviction, also made a highly unusual statement in support of Williams, saying that his laudable efforts opposing gang violence and his good works and accomplishments since incarceration 
may make him a worthy candidate for clemency from the governor. That came as a surprise to Robert Martin, the man who prosecuted Stanley Williams and sent him to death row. I just was astonished that uh, a judge would, would say that. Stanley was a very brutal person, and I would see no moral equivalent between what he's doing with the books and the crimes that have been charged. Do you think that he has redeemed himself? No, I, I don't. I think perhaps before his God in some way. That's a private affair. Let me put it to you this way. If you're an alcoholic, to be cured or to be rehabilitated, the first thing you have to do is to admit that you're an alcoholic. He's never admitted that he's a murderer. Therefore, how can he be rehabilitated? What's more, Vernell Crittenden says that if Stanley Williams were totally rehabilitated, he would not only admit to the murders, he would also agree to be debriefed by prison officials, giving them information about the Crips and the way they operate something Williams has so far refused to do. So you think that today, by sitting down and talking to prison authorities, he could help diffuse the situation on the streets? By him being himself involved in debriefing, it opens the door for others that are in the Crip gang to come forward, and they will tell their stories, but when they see their original godfather, who stands tall in the face of, as they say, in the face of death, and he refuses to tell anything, then that makes that young 16-year-old that's out there with that weapon feel just as committed. But what information could he have that would be of, of any value to law enforcement authorities who were investigating present-day gang activity when he's been so, he's been locked up for over 20 years? There's a great deal of contact that go on between the outside community and the inmates within these walls. He can explain to us how they gain their money, how they set up their trafficking. He can explain on how they have set up for the, the collection of weapons. Stanley Williams told me he doesn't have anything to give. He has no current information about the Crips, and even if he did, he says it would violate his code of honor to be debriefed. I have to say that the word debriefing is a euphemistic term for snitching. And uh, my, my convictions won't allow that. We need to have role models, particularly in our African-American communities, and a role model that says, I don't snitch on gang members, I don't care how violent or what acts they carry out, I think is the wrong message. Because gangs are running rapid through our communities. Young people out there killing one another, and they're buying into the same code of silence that Stanley w Williams is sharing with you today. Nevertheless, Professor Philip Gasper believes that the positive message Stanley Williams is sharing with children across the country in his books makes him worth more to society alive than dead. Well, what good would come from executing this guy? Here's somebody who is saying to kids, I can show you that there's a different way, somebody who they will listen to. If Stan is dead, then there aren't very many other people who can have that same kind of impact and influence on, on kids' lives. If Stanley Tookie Williams were just another vicious convict on death row trying to evade execution, or if he had been a vicious gang leader who now teaches school kids how to avoid becoming what he used to be, or if Williams had been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, not won one, just nominated for one, chances are it wouldn't have made a 60-minute story. With the rusty doors to the execution chamber creaking open, Stanley Tukey Williams shuffled in, shackled and cuffed, wearing a blue shirt, blue jeans, no shoes, just socks. I remember thinking how those pure white socks stood out to me, in stark contrast to what was about to be the darkest moment of his life. It was the end of the road for this convicted killer, a man who formed the notorious Crips gang in LA, on death row for killing four people, including military veteran Albert Owens. Tukey Williams' execution did not go smoothly, as my fellow media witnesses described that cold December morning. They had some trouble with the second IV, which was in the left arm. It took them, it, it may have been 10 minutes. It was just an awful lot of uh, sticking needles and taping things down, and he raised his head several times. At one point, asking the technician, are you doing that right? Quite simply, they couldn't find a vein. He looked 
exasperated at the length of the process of doing this. Williams' barrel-chested torso heaved. All I could hear were the weeping sounds from his victim's family. The reaction from the stepmother of Albert Owens was, still is, etched in my memory. And she was looking just straight at Williams the entire time, did not move whatsoever. From the time Williams walked into the chamber to the last moment he took his last breath, 36 minutes had passed. It remains one of the most difficult assignments I've ever been given, tougher to watch than I thought, and even more difficult to talk about. But it was the wheels of justice in motion. Wow. And one thing we couldn't show you was the spectator section, if you will, for lack of a better term, of the actual death chamber with rising bleachers. It was very archaic looking, very medieval looking, and they actually declared him dead through a squeaky door. A piece of paper emerged from it, and then they declared him dead once he was actually uh, put to death. Yeah, we talk about these executions, but very seldom do we actually get to see it play out in front of us, right? It was, Different it was bizarre, that's for sure. Snoop Dogg is not happy with Arnold Schwarzenegger. The Long Beach legend blasted the former California governor for his past decision to commute the sentence of Esteban Nunez, the son of a political ally. Nunez, who pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter in 2010 in order to serve a reduced 16-year sentence, was released on Sunday, April 10th. Here's what Snoop said over IG. Arnold Schwarzenegger's a straight bitch, punk motherfucker. How the fuck you gonna let this nigga out of jail, nigga, but you gonna kill Tookie Williams, nigga? Cause homeboy was your friend. You was a bitch. You was a punk. Motherfucker. I can't stand you. You one motherfucking racist piece of shit. Fuck you, Arnold Swartz, nigga. You got the right name, nigga. The family of Luis Santos, the man who was allegedly stabbed by Nunez, also had some strong words for Schwarzenegger. My son was stabbed in the heart when he was alive, Fred Santos, Luis's father, said, according to CNN. Schwarzenegger stabbed him in the back after my son is killed. In 2005, Crips founder turned activist Stanley Tukey Williams asked Schwarzenegger, who was governor at the time, for clemency. His request was denied, and on December 13, 2005, Williams was executed by lethal injection.